Hello and welcome to today's webinar featuring Fang Zhang. I'm Claire Cameron, Engagement Editor at Spectrum, the home for autism research news and analysis. We'll begin the presentation in a moment, but first, know that we'll be fielding questions at the end of today's presentation, but you can ask them at any point during the session. To ask a question, submit them via the chat window to the left of your screen. And as always, I'll note that if there are any members of the press tuning in, you can only report information presented during this webinar if that material has already been published elsewhere, or if you have first obtained express written permission from the presenter. Feng Zhang joins us today from Boston, where he is a core member of the Broad Institute of the Massachusetts Institutes for Technology and Harvard University. He is also an investigator at the McGovern Institute for Brain Research at MIT and the James and Patricia Poitras Professor in Neuroscience at MIT. He is also an Associate Professor in the Departments of Brain and Cognitive Sciences and Biological Engineering. Before joining the faculty at MIT and Harvard, Zhang received his BA in Chemistry and Physics from Harvard College and his PhD in Chemistry from Stanford University. Zhang has received numerous awards for his work, including the Canada Gerdner International Awards, the Tang Prize, the Black Vinick National Award for Young Scientists, and the Albany Medical Center Prize in Medicine and Biomedical Research, among others. Zhang pioneered the development of genome editing tools for use in eukaryotic cells, including human cells, from natural microbial CRISPR systems. He and his team have adapted multiple CRISPR systems for use as genome engineering tools. His long-term goal is to develop novel therapeutic strategies for treating human conditions. Welcome, Professor Zhang. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you for uh, joining our seminar. Um, I'm very uh, pleased to be able to see some of the latest advances that we have been making in genome editing technologies. As a way of getting started, uh, one of the really exciting advances in biology has been the sequencing of the human genome, and then the cost for sequencing uh, individual genome has dropped precipitously. So now we can uh, quite uh, inexpensively sequence uh, full genome sequences. With the accumulation of many genome sequences, um, scientists have been able to identify uh, differences between the genomes that underlie disease. So for example, um, uh, scientists have identified mutations that cause sickle cell disease or cystic fibrosis, uh, different forms of eye degeneration that lead to blindness, and so forth. But not all genetic differences are necessarily harmful. In fact, some are potentially beneficial. So uh, certain mutations uh, in a gene called CCR5 can confer resistance to HIV infection, and other uh, individuals have uh, differences in their APOE gene that uh, lead to reduced risk for Alzheimer's disease, and also uh, certain uh, genetic differences uh, underlie uh, reduced risk for diabetes. So you may be thinking now that if we know what genetic mutations cause disease, why not just go into cells and, let's say, get rid of the disease-causing mutations and put in uh, the potentially beneficial uh, genetic differences? It turns out that making these precise changes in the genome is challenging. So a lot of researchers over the past several decades have worked on ways to be able to make genome editing possible. And one of the approaches is through the use of DNA nucleases to make double-stranded DNA break. Maria Jason and also uh, Jim Haber uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering and also uh, the Brandeis University uh, discovered a couple decades ago that breaks in the DNA in the genome can stimulate cellular repair machineries to make precise uh, DNA changes and to make the efficiency much, much higher than what could happen naturally. So in order to take advantage of this uh, process, um, the development of site-specific DNA nucleases uh, is quite important. Um, and so a lot of different technologies have been developed to make it possible to be able to uh, cleave or cut the DNA in specific locations to be able to make those precise changes. Two of the earlier technologies uh, include uh, zinc finger proteins and also uh, tail proteins. These are naturally occurring protein motifs that bind to DNA. Uh, zinc fingers have modules that can be mutated uh, so that it can recognize new DNA sequences. And tail proteins also carry modules that can be 
recombining specific ways to recognize a specific DNA sequence. Using these DNA binding domains, we can recruit uh, nucleus uh, domains to specific sites in the genome uh, to introduce DNA double strand breaks. Now, for both zinc finger proteins and tail proteins, uh, even though they can be made to work, it's very hard to actually uh, use them uh, in day-to-day -day, uh, applications. And so one thing that we thought may, is maybe there are additional systems that we can uh, develop uh, to make genome editing and programmable cleavage of DNA uh, much more uh, simple. The solution um, actually uh, existed in a completely different place uh, in nature. Um, is found in a bacterial immune system called CRISPR. CRISPR uses RNA to recognize DNA, so you don't have to build a, a big protein uh, to recognize uh, the DNA. And this small RNA works with CRISPR-associated enzymes, which are called Cas enzymes, uh, to form a complex that can search along the genome and find the right place uh, to make a double-stranded cut. And so if we can harness this to um, recognize a specific site in the human genome, then we can uh, use this system uh, to achieve genome editing. So I first learned about uh, this CRISPR system when I read a paper by a Canadian researcher uh, named Sylvain Moynou. Uh, in 2010, he had published a paper in Nature uh, describing that a protein called Cas9 uses RNA to make double-stranded breaks uh, in DNA. And so I thought maybe we can um, borrow this system from bacterial cells, engineer it so that it can work in human cells and allow us to uh, programmably uh, find and also cleave specific sites in the human cell genome uh, for genome editing applications. Working with a number of uh, researchers in my laboratory, uh, including uh, Le and also uh, Fei and Ren, uh, we uh, successfully engineered Cas9 uh, to be able to cleave the human genome by providing Cas9 with uh, RNAs that can be programmed to recognize a specific uh, sequence uh, that we want to edit, uh, we can uh, use Cas9 to make a precise uh, DNA double-stranded break and stimulate uh, DNA repair machineries to allow us to edit the genome. So since um, that early uh, series of experiments, I continue to work with a number of other labs, uh, uh, lab uh, members including uh, Patrick Su and David Scott and, and Ben Holmes, to further interrogate how well Cas9 can recognize and cleave DNA and to develop computational tools that will allow researchers to be able to conveniently and also quickly uh, design different CRISPR uh, RNA guide molecules so that they can apply the system in a variety of their own uh, experiments. Um, here is a movie that illustrates uh, how the basic CRISPR-Cas9 system works for gene editing. Uh, the blue glob is the protein, and the red uh, piece is the RNA guide that has been pre-programmed to recognize a specific sequence of DNA in the genome. By engineering and introducing this complex into the human cellular nucleus, where the genomic DNA is, the enzyme will search on, along the DNA and uses the RNA in red to base pair with the DNA to see whether or not it found the right location. And upon this recognition, uh, the enzyme cleaves the two strands of blue DNA and forms a double-stranded break. The double-strand break can uh, be repaired through a process called non-homologous injoining, uh, where uh, the two ends are processed a little bit and then re-glued together. And this mutation can sometimes be used to inactivate a gene of interest. So for example, a deleterious gene can be uh, inactivated in the cell uh, by using this process. The second way that we can achieve gene editing is by providing the cell with a piece of synthetic DNA uh, shown here in purple. The two ends of the synthetic DNA uh, can match the broken ends of the DNA, and then through repair, uh, this new synthetic DNA can get incorporated into a specific site in the genome in a very precise way uh, to achieve genome editing. And so these are the two methods that we use uh, to achieve gene editing uh, using the CRISPR system. So the first application is using the nucleus, the cleaving function of Cas9 for genome editing. But beyond that, we can also use Cas9 to recruit a number of different effector modules 
uh, two speci specific sites in the genome uh, to achieve genome modulation. And so this is what's shown on the bottom. By inactivating the two um, amino acids on the Cas9 protein that uh, the enzyme uses to cleave DNA, we can turn Cas9 into a generic DNA binding domain. So it simply recognizes DNA, but it doesn't cleave it. And using this, we can then bring other effector modules, uh, things that can turn genes on or turn genes off, or uh, even a green fluorescent protein uh, to be able to visualize specific sites in the genome. Uh, other scientists, such as David Liu um, at Harvard, has also used this DNA binding domain to bring specific enzyme domains, uh, such as uh, deaminases, to be able to uh, modify uh, different DNA bases uh, on the genomic DNA. So there are many different tantalizing applications uh, to the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing system. And so one of the really exciting uh, potential uh, application is how can we use this uh, to treat diseases by modifying disease-causing mutations. And so working with a, a few different folks in the lab, including Le and Anne and Winston, we then examine the diversity of Cas9 to find a small one so that we can easily deliver in vivo uh, into the specific organ uh, that we want to treat. And so um, what you see on this slide is a phylogenetic distribution uh, of the Cas9 uh, family of proteins. And then by looking at all of them, we were able to find a small one from an organism called Staphylococcus aureus uh, to be able to achieve efficient uh, delivery into animals. This protein is very small, and we can fit it uh, into a single adeno-associated virus uh, to be able to achieve um, in vivo, efficient in vivo, in vivo uh, delivery. And then by programming this to recognize a gene called PCSK9, we can then use uh, this Cas9 uh, to be able to inactivate PCSK9. PCSK9 is a prominent uh, therapeutic target that many uh, drug companies are using uh, to develop drugs for reducing cholesterol and improve uh, heart health. And so we thought by using gene editing, we can inactivate this gene to mimic a naturally occurring human uh, mutation uh, that naturally reduces uh, individuals' risk uh, for cardiovascular disease. To test how well this works, uh, we uh, took a mouse model and developed AAV viruses so that we can deliver it uh, directly into the liver of these mice. On the left side uh, are gene editing results, where we show that uh, within seven days after delivering this virus into a mouse, we can achieve over 40% editing at the PCSK9 gene. Now, if you look at the middle graph, uh, what we found is within seven days after injecting this virus, the amount of PCSK9 protein in the serum of this mouse um, is no longer detectable. And that's a really good sign. It means that we are able to successfully introduce a loss of function or inactivating uh, change uh, into this PCSK9 gene. Finally, on the right side, uh, we're looking at uh, the level of cholesterol in the blood of, of these mice. And what we found is that uh, similar to the PCSK9 protein level, and the cholesterol level also decreased within seven days of virus injection, and then it persisted for the rest of the time points and we were able to lower cholesterol by about 50%, and that represents a significant uh, reduction in the risk for cardiovascular disease. So that's one uh, really exciting uh, possibility, but in order to advance Cas9 so that we have um, a molecule that is good enough for in vivo uh, therapeutic application, we also need to make sure that this enzyme is specific. So working with um, other lab members, uh, Ian Slaymaker, Ling Yi Gao, and, and Bern Zetcha, we uh, developed a way to be able to modify Cas9 and make it uh, recognize DNA with higher stringency. And so the way this works is by inactivating um, the positive charges that non-specifically interact with the DNA, we can uh, get the enzyme to recognize uh, DNA and only bind to DNA when there is, uh, when, when, when there is sufficient uh, specific recognition. And so if you look at a crystal structure, which is shown here on the right, we can color that uh, with uh, the surface charges on this protein. Uh, in this picture on the right, uh, blue is positive, positive charge and red is negative charge. 
and um, and so we thought maybe we can uh, remove some of these positive charges that interact with DNA uh, to make the enzyme more specific. We found that this is a very promising strategy. Um, on this plot, uh, this is the wild type Cas9 without any of the specificity enhancing uh, optimizations. Uh, we find that uh, for a specific uh, gene we're trying to target, which is VEGFA, uh, we do observe uh, two prominent off-target uh, editing sites. But when we introduce these specificity enhancing um, uh, optimizations, uh, these uh, K810 to, uh, to alanine mutations and arginine uh, 1003 to alanine mutations, for example, uh, we can make the enzyme uh, remain Active, uh, remain just as active as the wild type, uh, but now uh, without the off-target uh, editing uh, rates. So this is, this is really good. Um, as we uh, further take the strategy to engineer the Cas9 protein, uh, we can make it uh, both efficient, uh, but also uh, specific at the same time. So that was a lot of things we had done uh, with um, uh, engineering Cas9 for different applications. But as we were working on Cas9, we were really amazed by how diverse nature is. And we asked the question, are there more enzymes that are both interesting and also have biotechnological potential uh, from the bacterial diversity? And if so, maybe we can uh, study them and then harness them uh, for developing interesting applications. So um, to, to get this work started, um, one of the first things we um, did is, is to look at the classification of CRISPR systems. CRISPR are classified into class one and class two. Um, many class one systems uh, have already been identified and they use multiple proteins to work with the RNA guide to recognize and destroy uh, invading viruses. But Cas9 was the only class two system that scientists have identified uh, up to that point. And so we thought, uh, because Cas9 is simpler, it only uses a single uh, protein uh, to work with RNA guide and to cleave DNA. Uh, maybe, just like class one systems, there could be uh, other uh, single component class two systems uh, that, uh, that we can discover. Working with uh, our collaborator, uh, Eugene Kunin uh, at NIH and, and additional lab members uh, from both my and also Eugene's groups, uh, we set out on a computational uh, an experimental uh, strategy uh, to be able to identify and study uh, novel CRISPR systems. And so by using one of the most well-conserved CRISPR proteins uh, called Cas1 uh, to mine the bacterial genomic diversity, we were able to find a number of candidate genes uh, that were uh, putative uh, new CRISPR enzymes. And so on this um, phylogenetic tree on the right, um, we summarize all of the different types of CRISPR systems of the class two variety that we have identified to date. So up on, on the top are the type two CRISPR systems with, which uses uh, Cas9 uh, to recognize DNA and cleave DNA. And through this computational uh, work, we had identified two new types of CRISPR systems, namely the type five or Cas12 uh, family of CRISPR enzymes. They also target DNA and can be engineered to achieve genome editing. Um, and then the third uh, type is the type six, which uses Cas13 to recognize RNA and cleave RNA. So we had done a lot of work uh, with both Cas9 and also Cas12, but for the rest of today's talk, I thought we'll just focus on uh, discussing the Cas13 family of RNA targeting uh, enzymes. But before we dive into Cas13, I just want to briefly highlight uh, CPF1, uh, which is a different uh, type of uh, DNA editing enzyme uh, that complements uh, Cas9 uh, to allow us to have a wide and, and a versatile toolbox uh, for gene editing. Now, onto Cas13. So Cas13 were found in bacterial species that are pretty hard to work with. And so the first thing we did is to take the Cas13 system, the entire locus, and transfer that into E. coli so that we have a cell that's much easier uh, to experiment with. And the first thing we did is to do RNA sequencing. And through that, we found that the CRISPR array, which encodes the guide RNAs, is successfully expressed and also matured into the individual guide RNA molecules. So that's a very good sign. And based on the hypothesis that Cas13 
has motifs that, that correspond to RNAs uh, domains, we then set up a experimental assay to test whether or not Cas13 is indeed an RNA uh, editing, uh, RNA cleaving enzyme. And then also, uh, what are the parameters that govern how Cas13 uh, recognizes and, and also cleaves a recognized piece of RNA? So through this experiment, uh, we found that Cas13 can indeed target RNA. And moreover, um, it targets RNA um, uh, re uh, re by requiring uh, the three prime flanking region to have a single nucleic uh, acid base, uh, which is either C or A or a U. One of the really interesting things about Cas13 uh, is that in addition to just recognizing and cleaving the target RNA, it also has what we call collateral activity, which means that upon recognition of the target RNA, uh, the Cas13 enzyme switches on and becomes the non-specific RNAs, and they can cleave any other RNA uh, that's in the, in the local vicinity. So that means um, uh, what we found is that uh, on, on this gel on the right, uh, as long as you are providing uh, the target RNA, uh, despite the collateral RNA not sharing any homology uh, with the guide RNA, so it cannot be recognized by the guide RNA, it will get cleaved uh, nonetheless. And this non-specific cleavage mechanism um, tells us that maybe Cas13 uh, provides a really interesting uh, additional mode of defense for bacteria. And that's something that we call uh, program cell death. So if the enzyme uh, is not able to recognize the infection at an earlier point and the virus began to replicate, then if the enzyme recognizes after, only after the replication uh, has happened, uh, then we'll have many molecules of enzymes switched on to a non-specific RNA's uh, active form, and they can go and chew up many, many molecules of RNA and destroy the cell before the virus gets, uh, gets to spread to the rest of the population. So it's an additional way of providing defense uh, for the bacteria. So using this uh, collateral DNA uh, or collateral RNA cleaving activity, uh, we can then uh, develop an application for Cas13, and that's using it to diagnose an infectious disease. Whether it's viruses or bacteria, we can program Cas13 to recognize uh, that uh, RNA or DNA and then uh, trigger a signal uh, that would allow us to read out. And so this is a system that we call Sherlock. It's a two-step process that initially uses the amplification to produce many copies of the RNA uh, that we're trying to detect. And then two, by using Cas13, along with a reporter that gets cleaved upon activation of this collateral activity, uh, we can get a many, many order of magnitude ampl amplification uh, in the signal so that we can uh, detect what is present. So uh, this is one example. Uh, the Sherlock reaction and all the reagents are quite robust. And so we can freeze dry the enzyme as well as reporter and other uh, reaction buffer onto a piece of filter paper, which can then be easily reconstituted uh, to then provide uh, detection. And so here, uh, we're trying to detect uh, specific uh, sequences uh, that either match Zika viruses uh, or dengue viruses. And we find that uh, when we use the RNA guide that's programmed to specifically recognize Zika, uh, we can achieve uh, quite a sensitive uh, detection. So for the bar graph on the right, we can achieve detection at about 20, 20 atomolar of sensitivity, which is equivalent to about uh, 10 molecules of, uh, of the virus per microliter sample. So the next thing we did is to also show that in addition to detecting RNA-based viruses, we can also detect uh, DNA uh, bacterial pathogens. And so here by using either the E. coli genomic DNA or the pseudomonas genomic DNA as the biological sample, uh, we can very specifically use Cas13 to uh, report the presence of either E. coli uh, or the presence of pseudomonas so that we can get a very easy and direct readout for the bacterial infection. Um, the Cas13 uh, system can also be uh, used to develop a much simpler readout system um, called ladder flow, uh, which is uh, very similar to uh, what you may see with a pregnancy test. And so here, we, report, we replace the reporter, um, which, is, uh, which previously was used 
uh, based on fluorescent uh, reporters, now with, uh, fluore uh, with, with a biotin and a FAM a molecule uh, tethered to RNA. When this gets uh, cleaved upon recognition of the target, we can flow this onto a lateral flow strip. Uh, if nothing is present, we see one line, and then if uh, the uh, virus or the bacteria is present, then a second line will appear and allow us to read out the present presence of the infection. This is a picture that shows um, what these lateral flow strips look like. And so over here, you can uh, see that uh, down to about 200 atomolar uh, sensitivity, we can get very robust uh, readout of the signal. And, uh, and so what that means is that we can uh, quite easily, using this uh, very low-tech uh, low solution, uh, be able to diagnose uh, infections. Furthermore, uh, we can also multiplex the system. Um, so what we find is that different versions of Cas13 uh, from different bacterial strains uh, cleave uh, different sequences. And so by building reporters that, that have uh, either AU, UC, AC, or GA sequences, we can have four different Cas13s to be able to recognize uh, each one of these uh, reporters uh, specifically to then be able to achieve a very precise uh, recognition and also uh, reporting uh, of the infection, uh, four different things at once. Here is one example where we uh, use three different uh, Cas13 to recognize three different uh, types of RNA species, uh, each one uh, reported by its own reporter. And, uh, and what you see over here on the right is that when we have nothing, you don't get any signal. When you have one uh, of the three types of RNA, you get uh, the respective signal for that one specific uh, detection. And then if you have pairs or all three, uh, you can uh, very accurately uh, detect uh, the specific pathogen that's present. So that was one application using Cas13, which is to engineer it so that we can um, uh, uh, develop diagnostics assays. Uh, the second application is engineering uh, Cas13 to be able to recognize and also edit uh, specific RNA sequences. To do that, um, one of the reasons is uh, DNA-based gene editing is, um, is difficult uh, to do in post-mitotic uh, terminally differentiated cells because the cells are no longer replicating and the machineries uh, for performing uh, DNA recombination is not, uh, uh, is not very active. So if we can introduce the machineries for editing RNA, into a post mitotic cell, then, we'll be able, then we will be able to achieve a much higher uh, level of efficiency uh, for uh, gene editing. So the way we do this is we take Cas13, uh, akin to how we use uh, a uh, Cas9 to recruit things to DNA sequences. We can inactivate the two nuclease domains, which are the two hepin domains on Cas13, so that it binds to RNA and doesn't cleave it. And we can use this to bring different uh, catalytic domains to specific uh, RNA sequences and perform uh, RNA modification. Uh, on this schematic, uh, where uh, this describes how we can take a dead Cas13 uh, and use it to bring the catalytic domain of ADAR, which is an anti deaminase molecule, uh, to a specific piece of RNA. By programming the guide RNA uh, to specify a specific adenosine for deamination, we can get ADAR to convert specific adenosines to inosines on the target RNA. And so when we do this, uh, we can very efficiently uh, achieve conversion to RNA, and, and these inosines can be read out by the ribosome as a guanosine so that we get um, a specific interpretation, uh, or we get, we get a, a altered interpretation of the RNA so that we can correct a specific amino acid. This is a more detailed schematic of how we go about doing RNA editing. Um, the, the sequence on the top is the target RNA, and then on the bottom is the design for the guide RNA. The guide sequence is shown in red, and then to specify the specific adenosine for deamination, uh, we introduce a cytosine mispair uh, against that adenosine. And so that's the blue cytosine that you see, and that specifies the base that we want to be able to edit. When we developed the first version of the system, we thought to see how well does this system work. And what we find is that it can very robustly uh, edit on-target sequence, but across the transcriptome, 
even at low coverage of sequencing 12.5x, uh, we see um, quite a few off-target sites. And so by doing a control experiment, uh, we were then able to compare the uh, off-target sites, and we find that um, the many of the off-target sites are actually not dependent on the guide sequence. And that means um, it's probably something coming from the protein uh, that's causing these off-target sites. So fortunately, uh, the crystal structure for uh, ADAR has been uh, resolved by Peter Beal's group at UC Davis. And we thought maybe uh, by using some of the um, non-specific uh, RNA contacting residues in ADAR that Peter had identified, uh, we can uh, convert them and make Cas13 uh, ADAR uh, to deaminate in a much more specific way. By testing a large number of different mutations, uh, we find that threonine 375 to glycine uh, can significantly increase uh, the on-target editing uh, specificity. And so that's something that we thought to then incorporate into the RNA editing system uh, to make it uh, more specific. Here's a comparison of the original version one of the system with version two. Um, what we found is that uh, the version one system can deaminate the target adenosine uh, pretty well but it will also deaminate many other nearby adenosines uh, causing off-target editing. Uh, for the version two of the system, on the other hand, it becomes a lot easier, uh, a lot more specific, and a lot easier to target uh, the target base. And so now we can abolish uh, these other non-specific adenosine uh, deamination events and, and focus only on the target that we're trying to change. So how does it look across the transcriptome? Here we uh, did much, much deeper uh, transcriptome sequencing, uh, a tenfold uh, deeper. And what we found is that the on-target is still robust, uh, but with the version one of the system, we now have uh, close to 20,000 20, off-target sites. But uh, when we introduced this T375G mutation uh, and sequenced at the same uh, high depth of 125X, uh, we find that uh, we can reduce the off-target from 20,000 uh, down to about 20 off targets, so about a thousand fold increase in specificity. Um, and, and the enzyme remains pretty active. It does uh, become a little less active compared to the version one of the system, but that's something that we're now uh, working very actively uh, to, to be able to bring back up for, for the overall system. So these are uh, some really exciting things that we are continuing to work on, and uh, we're focused on further, further increasing the specificity and also the efficacy of the system so that they can work well. And we're also um, focused on establishing uh, effective delivery systems so that we can put this into the in vivo uh, uh, experiments. And also uh, we can augment the number of uh, DNA uh, RNA bases that we can change to expand the range of editing that we can uh, perform uh, using uh, this repair system. But this is all just uh, some of the things that uh, nature has uh, created uh, over um, its long history and also in the bacterial uh, natural diversity. Uh, to date, there are about 140,000 bacterial genomes uh, sequenced, and most of the genes in those genomes have not been studied. And what that means is uh, there are likely many, many other interesting bacterial systems that we can uh, study and also harness to develop new technologies. Finally, uh, last but not least, uh, I just would like to acknowledge my team um, and as well as our collaborators and funding agencies, and, and in particular, uh, the Simons Foundation for hosting this webinar. And, uh, and thank you for all of your interest uh, in, uh, in gene editing technologies. Um, we do have some time for questions. Um, so I'm just going to ask these now, just getting them up on my screen, sorry for the delay. Okay, so the first one was, oh, I appear to. Are we good now? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so the first question we had um, was how, Will these tools translate from the lab to actually uh, using it in a therapeutic way? What, 
what needs to happen for that to actually uh, make the leap. Steps that need to be taken to turn this into a real therapeutic. Uh, it begins with uh, laboratory testing of the tools uh, in cellular models and also in animal models to make sure that uh, at least in these simpler systems, we can achieve both efficient and also precise editing. And after um, seeing enough um, um, encouraging result in these preclinical models, then the next thing to do is to move it into uh, larger animals, um, possibly um, uh, non-human primates or, or other animals that best model the disease uh, that we're trying to address. And in those models, um, several things will be tested, uh, safety, um, efficacy, um, as well as looking at how will the body uh, of a much, much larger uh, animal be able to tolerate these novel uh, modes of therapeutic. And so when all that data um, begins to look really good, then, um, then we can begin to plan out um, uh, development of this as, as a therapeutic and clinical testing. Several things need to happen um, clinically. Uh, there needs to be, um, so a lot of thought have, have to be put into thinking about what are the right patients to, re to recruit. Um, because for each disease group, there are likely many different genotypes, different mutations uh, that um, affect the different patients within the same disease group. And then second, how do we go about manufacturing uh, these reagents that are gonna be delivered into, into individuals? We have to make sure that the reagent is very pure, uh, it's of high quality, and also it needs to be able to be produced through a standardized process that can be repeated time after time so that we can make sure uh, from trial to trial the consistency of the reagent uh, is really, really high. So when, when that's all done, and um, the next thing to figure out is when we apply this into patients, um, what are the endpoints? How do we know that the therapy is working? What do we measure? What do we um, uh, look, uh, both in terms of molecular changes in the patient, uh, as well as behavioral uh, phenotypic changes that show that uh, the disease has gotten better? When all those uh, different things have been uh, identified and defined, then clinical trial may get started. And then, um, and then when results are, are positive and, and over a number of patients, uh, uh, that there is efficacy, uh, then this may become um, a uh, therapeutic uh, for addressing the, the overall uh, disease population. All along the way, uh, many uh, experts have to weigh in, uh, both from the scientific side, the technical side, uh, as well as the, the medical side and the regulatory uh, agencies. Uh, they need to uh, oversee this and make sure that the process is carried out in a rigorous fashion so that uh, a high quality uh, therapeutic molecules developed. Another question we had was, what relevance can editing RNA and the Cas13 system have for studying autism? There are um, a lot of uh, interesting applications of Cas13 to the study of autism. Um, autism um, affects uh, many parts of the body. Uh, in particular, if, if it affects uh, cells in the brain. Using DNA gene editing, uh, sometimes it can be challenging to interrogate uh, specific mutations uh, in, the, in the neuronal genome. Uh, and RNA editing uh, makes it uh, more likely that we can make those precise changes and study the effect of those changes uh, in, in brain cells. And so as we sequence more and more um, uh, genomes of individuals who are affected by uh, genetic mutations and, and exhibit autism spectrum disorder, uh, we can use RNA editing and DNA editing, uh, probably best applied uh, in a synergistic way um, uh, to the disease uh, animal models or cell, cellular models uh, to be able to figure out uh, what is the molecular mechanism underlying these diseases. It's also possible that RNA editing may be turned into a therapeutic uh, for treating um, uh, autism spectrum disorders. Uh, as we identify um, uh, specific causative uh, genetic mutations, uh, like the MECP2 mutation in Rett syndrome, it may be possible to develop uh, RNA editing uh, systems to be able to correct those mutations at the RNA level 
so that the neuronal cells in the brain are producing the correct protein products and be able to alleviate uh, the disease uh, symptom. Another question we had from uh, Facebook actually um, was scientists um, have used CRISPR-9 um, very successfully in mice and other models. Um, do you think that using CRISPR-9 to fix a genetic mutation that affects people, for instance, who have the syndrome associated with Shank-3, which is a very long gene, um, would have just as much efficacy? It'll, it's probably going to be difficult to use uh, gene editing to fix uh, Shank-3 at the moment. Um, uh, some Shank-3 mutations are single point, but others might be resulting from larger deletions. Um, and those affect uh, brain cells, uh, which are particularly uh, difficult to both deliver to and also to be able to uh, correct at the genomic level. Uh, so I think it will probably be a while uh, and it will require a development of possibly new technologies uh, to make it possible uh, to address that disease. Is there a fear that in using CRISPR-based tools um, to edit or else repair um, a gene, that gene's other regulatory properties might be disrupted in ways that hadn't been foreseen? These are, um, these are interesting and, and good questions. Um, and they are, they are questions that um, researchers, especially uh, folks who are working on developing uh, these as therapeutics, uh, are, are looking into um, tech, the, the CRISPR-Cas9 and, uh, and, and, and the Cas13 uh, technologies are still fairly new. Uh, it's only since 2013 that we have been able to uh, edit um, uh, DNA using these systems. Um, it, it will probably, uh, it will still take a little bit uh, more work in order for us to uh, fully and systematically uh, answer those questions. And, and the answers will inform um, better development of this as a therapeutic. Do you think that there will be the same progress in terms of the applications of CAS-13 as there have been for the CAS-9 system? Um, the CAS-13 field is also moving forward quite quickly, and uh, many groups have adopted CAS-13 uh, and use it uh, to study uh, both basic uh, bi biological questions uh, as well as using it uh, to develop therapeutics. Uh, in addition to our work on RNA editing and RNA knockdown, uh, other groups have also shown that CAS-13 can be used to alter gene splicing uh, and also uh, additional applications of CAS-13 uh, in diagnostics. So um, I think what is really exciting is that um, all of these different enzymes that bacterial cells have evolved over billions of years uh, are uh, turning out to be really useful tools uh, and, uh, and is helping to accelerate uh, the progress in biology. You've mentioned a few of these microbial systems in your talk and also another one which name um, escapes me that's not a cat system. Um, but do you feel like there's still many more of these, uh, these editors out there that we have yet to find? Probably. Um, I think what we have uh, looked at so far are only a very small number of uh, genes in the bacterial diversity. Um, there are 140,000 genome sequence uh, so far, and that's probably a very, very sparse sampling of the uh, microbial diversity that exists uh, on Earth. And as we sequence more, uh, especially from very different environments like geothermal vents or uh, from uh, the stratosphere uh, and, and the Antarctica, uh, we're going to find that there's much, much greater diversity uh, that, uh, than we uh, even uh, can imagine now. And then in order for these organisms to survive in so many different environments, uh, each one of them um, must have evolved uh, unique uh, approaches in order to be able to survive and replicate. And so by looking into um, these interesting systems that, that bacterial cells have evolved, for their own unique environment, um, it's very likely that we'll find uh, many, many, many uh, new systems uh, that are both interesting and also uh, useful. Hey, another question we had, what are some drug delivery methods that are being considered for RNA editing specifically in the brain? So um, 
uh, RNA editing and gene editing, um, they're all sort of part of uh, the overall, uh, overall class of gene therapy. And several ways um, have been developed so far uh, to allow delivery. Uh, viral vectors uh, is one of them that could be used to uh, deliver into the brain. It's been shown that intrathecal injection of um, ad adeno-associated viruses uh, can deliver uh, therapeutic molecules uh, quite efficiently uh, into, uh, into brain cells. Um, there are also lipid nanoparticles that are being uh, developed. Uh, it works, um, it seems to work fairly well in the liver so far and uh, further development may make it possible for the system to work uh, in, in the central nervous system. Uh, and then um, there are likely other uh, new systems that uh, uh, yet are yet to be developed that uh, may pro prove to have even greater utility uh, for central nervous system delivery. Another question we had was, do you think there is a possibility with the current tools uh, to develop a therapy for fragile X, which is the single most common cause of autism in the foreseeable future? Um, I, th I think um, there are uh, brain diseases uh, using gene editing, uh, I think is, is an area where uh, there's uh, very good and, and rapid development. Uh, so advances uh, with, uh, say, DNA-based editing technology and also the RNA editing technologies uh, will likely open up opportunities to be able to fix uh, individual mutations um, uh, or alter uh, regulatory sequences uh, in brain cells. Um, and then there are, of course, other uh, forms of mutations, expansions uh, in genes uh, that might be, that, that at least give, for, for the current generation technology is, um, is difficult to manip manipulate. And so for some forms of fragile X and strategies to, uh, to modify those expansions, uh, it, it may be challenging uh, in the near term. Uh, uh, but that's, that's something that we'll have to continue uh, to develop and also discover new technologies uh, in order to address. You've mentioned a lot of the different strategies that are being taken to ensure that off-target editing is minimized. And do you think that off-target editing is not going to be, it's going to become less and less of an issue for scientists to worry about as these technologies move forward? There's a lot of really good progress being made um, toward making Cas9 more specific. You can engineer the protein, you can control the way that it's delivered, and you can also uh, uh, control the duration that the cells are exposed to these gene editing, uh, DNA editing enzymes. All these different approaches, each one of them provide a, uh, several, uh, a, a several fold increase in specificity and, and they are complementary to each other. So overall, you can end up with systems that are, that are actually quite specific. So I think in terms of off-target activity, um, using all these advances, plus with um, a systematic analysis of the specificity of the specific guide RNA that's being developed for uh, a given therapeutic application, uh, we're, we're definitely able to uh, make the system quite specific. Also related to that, um, you mentioned that the way that you developed for decreasing Cas13 off-target editing um, also reduced the effect. Why do you think that is? So um, a lot of the, um, so the way that enzymes operate on DNA or RNA has to do with um, how well this enzyme is able to, to recognize, to find the RNA and DNA, and also how tightly is able to grab onto the RNA and DNA uh, to be able to uh, modify it. And so um, in engineering enzymes, what we have been uh, doing is to tweak the way that enzyme is able to recognize RNA and DNA. We wanted to um, rely on specific recognition and, and reduce non-specific recognition. So it's, it's, it's a balance that we have to achieve. We want there to be enough but not too much non-specific recognition so that the enzyme can grab onto and, and stay on the target uh, RNA or DNA for long enough. Uh, and, and at the same time, uh, we want to um, make sure that it doesn't sit for too long so that it go in and make other uh, unintended changes. 
Another question we had was, could you discuss some possible ethical concerns with gene editing, specifically in areas of brain function and cognition? Um, there, are, there are theoretical um, ethical concerns um, with gene editing, uh, but um, as for, for now, I think um, a lot of those ethical challenges um, are, are things that uh, we still have some time to, to work through. Um, challenges or, or concerns with cognitive enhancement or concerns with um, uh, you know, making designer babies, um, those are things that we don't even uh, know enough about biology to be able to treat uh, single mutation caused diseases, uh, much less do we know about um, uh, mutations to, to be able to engineer very complicated human traits. Um, and so, so I think there's still a lot of work for us to do, even to be able to treat um, uh, Red syndrome or, or other forms of autism spectrum disorder, uh, and, and, and it were um, uh, still quite a ways off from being able to um, to modify cognition and other things. Okay, um, we don't have any more questions, I don't think. So um, I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, thank you very much, Professor Fang, uh, Professor Zhang. And um, just to let everybody know, a complete replay of this presentation will be available on the Spectrum News site in a couple of days. This webinar is part of an ongoing series, so please check our site for upcoming talks to be announced soon and for video archives of previous webinars. Thanks again, Professor Zhang, and thank you all for tuning in.